Colleagues, if I could just encourage those at the door to move in and to move to their tables, that would be appreciated. Thank you. So, as indicated just before the break, uh, this is a very significant moment in our two-day convening. I am going to welcome to the stage uh, Suzanne Dillon, of course, who's already been introduced as uh, the Education 2030 IWG Chair. And Suzanne will be joined by Dirk Van Dam, a Senior Counselor, Directorate for Education and Skills at OECD. Could you please show your appreciation? very much Tony and um, yeah this is this is a high point of, of our few days work together for those of us from the uh, future of education and skills 2030 project um, I'd like to um, acknowledge the presence of Melanie Mark the Minister for Advanced Education Skills and Training and and particularly the very thoughtful uh, presentation that she made as we commenced back after lunch and I'm actually really anxious because I'm following, I think, a very powerful speaker in Jill Crona. Um, and what struck me, so those of you who are sitting near me could see that I was frantically working away on PowerPoint and notes. Um, I, I promise you that what I was actually doing was recording the consonances between what was being said up here and our project so that um, I would have the opportunity to feed those back to our informal working group over the next couple of days. Um, this is the moment when we launch the product of a four-year journey that has been undertaken by sometimes up to 250 individual delegates to our project, representing a very large network of countries, education partners, educators, students, education stakeholders, policy makers, government representatives, expert analysts, researchers, a very broad church of people. And I'd like to take the moment to acknowledge the, the work that was done by everybody, the challenges that we faced and continue to face, that we overcame and still have to grapple with, um, and I want to commend all of you from the informal working group for um, the bravery with which you embrace that challenge. And I'm going to take some of the language that Joe Crona used, because what we've been doing for the last four years is identifying places of intersection and places of dissonance from our various perspectives, where we've come from, what we would like to see as, as the pathway towards our future. And we've mined those places of dissonance, dissonance to develop new understandings and knowledge. And that knowledge is captured in our learning compass. The other thing that we've had to do and continue to have to do is to find a place of comfort with dissonance and disagreement and alternative perspectives. And actually, I was so struck by Jo's words when she said that sometimes what we do in the, in the name of working collaboratively is wait for other people to accept our paradigm rather than being open to having our paradigm challenged. Well, in our informal working group, we live that challenge every single day because we have representatives working with us from diverse backgrounds, cultures, and contexts. And so in putting together our learning compass, our intention was to provide direction and support for all of our various stakeholders and all of our participants and delegates, which might inform curriculum redesign to support our young learners so that um, we are not prescribing a curriculum. There is no curriculum note that says you must teach A, B, and C behind our compass. It is definitely something that points direction. It's accompanied by a range of concept notes that are dynamic because as we continue to debate and talk, 
they continue to develop. As we search to find a common language to talk internationally about education. It's not an easy challenge and I am in awe of the work done by our IWG members in rising to that challenge. So I'm really excited to say that after four years we are in a position to agree our compass. Our compass is, a, as I said, directional and it points towards well-being, the well-being of the individual student, the well-being of the teachers they work with, the communities and families that they come from, the societies that they live in and will create, the well-being of us all. And that's the direction in which we want to take this travel. That compass is accompanied by video narratives from students and teachers from around the world, which explain and demonstrate that the compass is more than something theoretical, but is grounded in real action. And that action looks different in each of our different individual contexts. So without any ado, I, I'm really happy to launch our framework. I'm going to invite Andreas Schleicher, who's in the Directorate for Education and Skills in the OECD. And he's going to um, join us via a video, a recorded video message. Unfortunately, Andreas had a responsibility to attend a ministerial council, but this project is really important to him, and so he has put together a video message for us. Immediately after the video message, without any pause at all, um, we're going to share with you an animation which attempts to communicate what our learning compass is about. And we, we hope to use this animation to take our compass beyond our informal working group and out into the wider world and publicise it. So without any ado, perhaps we might just play Andreas's message. Thank you. I'm so sorry that I can't join you today. Sorry that I can't join you today. OECD finance ministers decided to meet on the same day and they also want to talk about skills. But I know the most important people are right here in this room. The people who co-created our Education 2030 Learning Compass on the future of education. These days, education is no longer just about teaching students something, but about helping them develop a reliable compass and the tools to navigate with confidence through an increasingly complex, volatile, an uncertain world. Your Education 2030 Learning Compass shows us the way. And it has given us not just a shared vision, but also a shared language to talk about what students should learn and to be ready for tomorrow. And as the Learning Compass reveals, success in education is now about identity. It's about agency. And it's about purpose. It's about building curiosity, opening minds. It's about compassion, opening hearts. And it's about courage, mobilizing our cognitive, social, and emotional resources to take action. And that's also going to be our best weapon against the biggest threats of our times. Ignorance, the closed mind, hate, the closed heart, and fear, the enemy of agency. We live in this world in which the kind of things that are easy to teach and test have also become easy to digitize, to automate. The future is about pairing the artificial intelligence of computers with the cognitive, the social and emotional skills and values of humans. It's going to be our imagination, our awareness, and our sense of responsibility that will help us harness technology to shape the world for the better. These days, algorithms behind social media are sorting us into groups of like-minded individuals. They create virtual bubbles that op often amplify our own views, but leave us insulated from divergent perspectives. They homogenize opinions and polarize our societies. So tomorrow, schools need to help students think for themselves and join others with empathy in work, in citizenship. They will need to help them develop a strong sense of right and wrong, a sensitivity to the claims that other people make on us, and a deep grasp of the limits of individual and collective action. At work, at home, 
in the community, people will need a deep understanding of how others live in different cultures, in different traditions, and how others think, whether as scientists or artists. And whatever tasks machines may be taking over from humans at work one day, the demands on our knowledge and skills to contribute meaningful to social and civic life, they're going to keep rising. The growing complexity of modern living for individuals and communities and societies also means that the solutions to our problems will be complex. In a structurally imbalanced world, the imperative of reconciling diverse perspectives and interests in local settings, but with often global implications, means we need to become good in handling tensions and dilemmas. Striking a balance between competing demands, equity and freedom, autonomy and community, innovation and continuity, efficiency and democratic process. They will rarely lead to an either or choice or even a single solution. We need to think in a more integrated way that recognizes those inner connections. Our capacity to navigate ambiguity has become the key. Creativity and problem solving requires our capacity to consider the future consequences of our actions. With a sense of responsibility and with moral and intellectual maturity so that we can reflect on our actions in the light of experiences and personal and societal goals. The perception and assessment of what is right or wrong, good or bad in a specific situation is all about ethics. It implies asking questions related to norms, to values, meanings, limits. What should I do? Was I right to do that? Where are the limits? Knowing the consequences of what I did, should I have done it? That brings us to the toughest challenge in modern education. It's about how we incorporate values into education. Values have always been central to education, but it's time that they move from implicit aspirations to more explicit goals and practices. So they help communities shift from situational values, you know, I do whatever a situation allows me to do, to sustainable values that generate trust, social bonds, and hope. If education doesn't build foundations under people, Many are going to reach out to build walls, no matter how self-defeating that actually is. The bottom line is, if we want to stay ahead of te technological developments, we have to find and refine the qualities that are unique to our humanity and that complement, not compete with the capacities we have created in our computers. Schools need to develop first-class humans, not second-class robots. Education has made great strides to help us understand the world around us and even explore faraway planets. It's time that education helps us better understand our own minds and experiences. And we better understand our minds before some algorithms is going to make them up for us. Again, the learning compass shows us the way. But a compass is only as good as the use we make out of it. And the road of educational reform is littered with good ideas that were poorly implemented. It's important that here in Vancouver we cross that bridge and think how we can build a learning environments that empower and enact the Education 2030 framework. And how we can support teachers and educators so they can support every young person to stand center stage in their own lives. None of this is easy. None of this is going to be done overnight. But that's why we are here. And we are not alone. In fact, the power of the learning compass lies in the being co-created by the people and stakeholders who together are the future of education. Always remember that you're working on the Education 2030 project on behalf of all of the people who care about our future. Thank you again. OECD Learning Compass indicates how students can navigate through an uncertain and rapidly changing ecosystem to help shape the future we want. 
It is an evolving learning framework that helps create a common language and understanding about broad education goals. Co-created by policymakers, researchers, school leaders, teachers, and students from around the world, the OECD Learning Compass defines the competencies, made up of knowledge, skills, attitudes, and values, that students need to fulfill their potential and to contribute to the well-being of their communities and the planet. When a student holds the Learning Compass, he or she is exercising agency, the capacity to set a goal, reflect, and act responsibly to effect change, to act rather than be acted upon. But the student is not alone in this. He or she is surrounded by peers, parents, teachers, and the community, all of whom interact with and guide the student towards well-being. The Learning Compass shows that students need some core foundations before they can set off towards well-being. These include not only literacy and numeracy, but also data and digital literacy, physical and mental health, and social and emotional foundations. To shape their future and the future of society, learners need to develop certain transformative competencies. These are defined as the ability to create new value, reconcile tensions and dilemmas, and take responsibility for their own actions. These competencies are developed through a cyclical learning process, anticipating, acting, reflecting. As learners become more adaptive and reflective and take actions accordingly, they continually improve their way of thinking. While there may be many visions of the future we want, the well-being of society is a shared destination. The OECD Learning Compass orients learners of all ages towards that better future. Thank you. Well, indeed, this is a, a very important moment in the life of the OECD education work. Um, and it's actually uh, a great moment also to thank uh, me who and her team, Suzanne, and the many, many, many people who have worked uh, under her leadership on this, um, on this achievement. Um, I, I think it's important to thank you before I forget it, to do it at the end. <laughs> um, we are actually in a, in a great place to, to launch this initiative. And um, I could not think of any better place. I w I'm very impressed by what I've heard today about the education system in British Columbia. Um, and what I like so much is the continuous reflection on the purpose of education. And that's actually also what we find here in, in this learning compass. Um, there is no sign of complacency. Um, there is a very strong sense of agency to work on, on the many challenges that even in an excellent system are still there. So um, I think this is a very unique combination of place and time uh, to, to launch this um, compass. Um, it's a culmination, as Suzanne has mentioned, of four years um, of very hard work. And it's not the typical OECD work where people um, behind desks in Paris write very uh, thick reports. Um, no, this has been a very different process. And I want to stress that as well. It, it's a bottom-up process with the inclusive participation of a lot of stakeholders. Um, and that makes it so strong and so um, valuable. Um, we are here in a hotel where many ships are leaving the harbor. Um, and in the old days when sailors were sailing the seas, they looked at the stars to navigate. Um, and I don't think that looking at stars is anything wrong. Uh, I think also in curriculum work, in education, we should continue to reach for the stars. But gradually, I think 15th, 16th century, people 
started to use all kinds of devices and they uh, found out that there was a magnetic North Pole and that you can design a compass. Um, and a compass helps you to navigate these difficult waters and these stormy conditions uh, much better than just by looking at the stars. Actually, the combination of the two was what made sailors so successful in the 17th and 18th and 19th century. Um, and we should not f forget that. So dreaming is not opposite to navigating. Actually, it's um, complementary to each other. And I think that's actually where this learning compass is all about. The work started four years ago, has, as has been mentioned already, with this very simple question, what knowledge, skills, attitudes, and values will today's students need to thrive and to shape the world? Um, it looks very simple now, four years later. At the beginning, it was a very contentious question. It's not the kind of work that countries expect the OECD to do. Um, OECD is looked at for many different things, but not to define the substance, the content of education. Countries um, react, some countries even reacted, um, well, OECD is not going to prescribe what we need to teach in schools. We have all the authority to do that ourselves. And that's actually not what we were aiming at, but still the political process has been difficult. And I think um, the informal working group and the team at UECD has been very skillful in navigating also that difficult water of the political consensus. So what is it? It's a, a future-oriented framework for learning. It's a tool to help you to, to navigate through all these um, questions, to define a common language. Um, in a world of uncertainty, in a world of rapid change, uh, and we all know this kind of rhetoric about the volatility of the future and the rapid changes, et cetera, et cetera, and educators feel a little bit lost in this very fashionable um, language. So actually, it's also a tool for them to, to reach out for some stability. It's a, a navigating compass, a learning compass, helps you to create a little bit more certainty in this, in this world. As I mentioned, it has been the product of co-creation. Uh, and I think that is one of the most essential features and most valuable features of it. And it will also contribute to its success and to its implementation uh, in the field. Um, it's globally informed, um, many different cultures, many different stakeholders um, have contributed to it, um, and it, it, even in a very fragmented and differentiated world, it is proven, it has proven to be successful in defining a common language, a common uh, framework, which can then be locally contextualized. Is, there is nothing in the learning compass that prescribes how people should implement it locally. So it's certainly not prescriptive, and that's very important. We are not prescribing any educator, any school, any minister, any system to do whatever um, is important in education. It's not an assessment framework either. We do a lot of assessment in the OECD and that's very valuable, but I don't think the learning compass is something that um, leads it, leans itself very easily to um, assessment. And it's not a curriculum framework. It is a framework or a tool to make um, discussions on curriculum um, much more, uh, I think, easy and, and implementable. So that's it. Um, it's actually a very simple picture. Well, it's a bit complicated to read, but it's um, in, in its essence, it's very simple. And uh, I like the, the simplicity uh, because it's, um, it, it's reduced to what is really important. There is nothing in, in this image which I think is not necessary. Um, but it adds different layers to the simplicity which I find often lacking in competing um, models. 
We have an awful lot of materials behind this simple picture. Um, there is an, a, a very interesting website, a very rich website, where you can find all the papers, all the documents, um, also all the briefs that we produced, and there are a number of those briefs uh, outside on the, on the table. And we even developed a very, um, yeah, interesting tool, a kind of augmented reality tool uh, that you can use yourself. If you take your mobile phone and you download an app, either on your Apple or on your Android phone, uh, the Snap Press app, you can find it in Google Play or the App Store, um, and then you just scan this picture or this um, brief, then you have access to all the materials via your phone. So the, the website comes to life on your phone. You can listen to the videos, you can uh, read all the documents, etc. It's very, um, very nice and, and a little bit innovative um, as well. So I invite you, not now, but um, <laughs> in the coming days to, to explore that. As Andreas has mentioned, one of the central concepts is student agency, and I think it's a very important concept. It's actually the, the very central basic idea that learners are active, that they acquire agency, not being acted upon, but that they are constructing their own learning process and their own reality. Um, and also on that central topic, you have a lot of materials on, on the site. I mentioned already these briefs, for example here the, the brief on student agency and up, oops, you can pick um, one uh, outside. And then you have the first layer of uh, competencies, knowledge, skills, attitudes and, and values. Um, as I said, this is not unique. You don't have to be a genius to, the, to come to this classification. But it's, um, in its simplicity, it covers, I think, everything. In terms of knowledge, there is distinction made between disciplinary, interdisciplinary, epistemic, and procedural. People who have been following PISA very closely and the assessment framework of PISA will recognize the, the concepts which are used there as well. In terms of skills, cognitive and metacognitive. The metacognitive is something which is very dear to me. Um, it's a very important level of um, development. Social and emotional, we have heard a lot about that already. Physical and practical skills. In terms of attitudes and values, um, personal, local, societal, and global. Um, we try to develop ideas, concepts on all these different dimensions of attitudes and values. And we have the second layer of core foundations or foundation skills sometimes. We use that word. Literacy, numeracy, um, still very, very important. Um, social and emotional health, li digital literacy, data literacy. I very much personally, I very much like the layer of transformative competencies. Um, I think this is something which is almost unique to the learning compass. I don't know of any curriculum framework or conceptual model that includes them um, in, in, the same, in the same way. Um, creating new value, taking responsibility, and reconciling tensions and dilemmas. I think these these three really go to the heart of what, what education and learning um, is about. And then finally, anticipation, action, reflection. So putting it into reality, into practice, um, that's the outer circle, the outer uh, layer of the, of the compass. So you have these different elements of the compass. Um, we are developing a, um, another tool on the website, it's not there yet, uh, where we try to uh, link all those concepts and ideas 
in a kind of interactive map and it will further add to the understanding and the insights um, underneath the learning compass. Um, we will also produce an alignment with other frameworks, so more materials coming, a glossary even, frequent, uh, frequently asked questions section, um, and then some further, some further background. So th there is a lot there yet, there is a lot more coming to make it even more valuable and more practical. Um, I think Suzanne already mentioned that this um, launch comes at the end of a four-year process um, and tomorrow the informal working group will, will meet on defining the essence of the next phase um, and that phase goes into more the curriculum implementation um, area and this is uh, going to be another fascinating um, phase of the project. Um, I hope over three, four years we will be able to launch something equally fascinating. It will not be in D BC, um, but it will be somewhere um, different. So the next phase is focusing on teachers' profiles, teachers' competencies, um, what are actually on the other side of the learning exchange between students and, and teachers, what is happening there in order to make this learning compass happen. So um, a lot of work still ahead of us, um, but this is a very important moment and also a celebration. I thank you so much for your attention. Um, thank you very much, Dirk. And, and thank you too for recognizing the place that we're in and I would like on behalf of the informal working group family to actually uh, thank very much the First Nations people for welcoming us here to work with you. Uh, we're greatly honored by that invitation. Now, the end or the target behind all of this are our students. So I'm going to invite three students to come to the stage to mention just briefly what the Learning Compass means for them. So Ayumi Mitsui, Alan Sacera, and Ruby Burke. Thank you. Can I start? Okay. So, thank you, Suzanne. I'm Ayumi from Tokyo, Japan. I'm really delighted to have a chance to share the comments with you all for the launch of Learning Compass. And I feel the students are truly accepted as one of the stakeholders of education. I understand the learning compass will be an icon to represent the concept of Education 2030, which was collaboratively created by so many people. And I hope it will be a real compass for all of us, which, which can lead us to well-being, not just as an icon. When we take an action, it will start functioning. When we get lost, it will guide us to the next step. My learning compass started working when I joined ISN, Innovative Schools Network, and participated in the ACE IWG meeting in Paris as a student representative of ISN. All students, teachers, and adults I met there were highly motivated to make good differences to education and export education to develop necessary competencies for students to create the future we want. I was very inspired by them, especially when I saw voices of students were heard. It is often said that we Japanese are lack of passion and competencies to change the status quo, and actually it's partly true. <laughs> but as a representative of students of Japan, let me make a point. Many students in Japan are determined to innovate today's education. Influenced by them, my learning compass started to navigate me, even though my compass is still immature. I would like to share the things I learned in this meeting with others when I go back to Japan, 
and we'll explore how Compass can be developed with my peers, teachers, and adults. As our student declaration of the ISN states, I believe learning always starts from sharing aspirations with people around you. I'm so excited to participate in this learning community in the ninth, I ninth ideology meeting, which will accelerate to develop a running compass. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I am Alan Salcera. I'm a student in Mexico, and I have been in this project since 2017. I am part of the student advisory group as well. The Learning Compass has helped us define a strategic method to follow education. We are glad that in this forum, we students are being heard. We have created the student advisory group in where we have been in charge of a Facebook discussion with more than 200 students. We have created the monthly newsletter in where we include a uh, student spotlight and what, what is going on in this project. And we have gathered narratives from students all around the world. And actually, we have gathered more stories than in the OECD meetings. <laughs> the student group has created a student agency in where students work as community leaders. We have selected the competencies that we would have liked to acquire in our previous scholar years. Let's take this moment as an opportunity to work as partners. Collaboratively, we will, we will work better. We students want, want to act, not to be acted upon. We want to make change, and we, and we want our voices to be heard, not to be silented. We students want to continue working in curriculum change. Thank you very much. Hello everyone, my name is Ruby. I'm a graduate from the Green School in Bali, which is basically a big bamboo school in the middle of the Balinese jungle. And at Green School, we talked a lot about wallless classrooms. So not necessarily the idea that you have to learn in a classroom that's made out of bamboo and has no walls, but more of a cultural shift, a mindset that Learning inside a wallless classroom means you're in the outside world. You're, you have no boundaries to your learning. Your teachers your, are your mentors. Your peers are your mentors. And students drive their own learning. And looking at the learning compass, it really combines this idea and it complements the fast-paced world and the future that we will be inheriting as youth. The world ahead of us and now is scary. I mean, students just had to strike from school a few weeks back, holding up signs that literally said, why are we studying for a future we currently don't have? There is no doubt us youth are facing global issues on an unprecedented scale. And we need to make sure education adapts to that. The Learning Compass is essentially the beginning of this transition to real world and outside education. That each empowered student can change the world. We can see that student agency relies inherently on co-agency and vice versa. We can see how our learning is deeply connected to sustainability. So the connection between nature, society, uh, the economy and well-being. And when students are able to see how their learning connects directly to sustainability is what creates a lifelong learner and change maker. Today's world needs to be deeply connected to youth education, for them to be able to step outside those school gates and know that they can change the world for the better together. The Learning Compass shows us the larger picture of learning, our own learning pathways, and reminds us that these can be adapted to our own interests, our own passions, and our own strengths. We can feel as though we can take real action to solve real world problems. 
Now this is the most powerful realisation a student can ever have. Now students of today can understand and see what steps they can take to leverage upon themselves and the world around them. Thank you. Thank you so much and thank you for being the voice of the many students that you have connected with as part of the work done over the last four years and we encourage continued connections. There is a lot that we can learn from young people uh, and we hope there's a little that they can learn from us. Um, I'm going to just draw this to a close now by thanking you all for your attention and for your respect and for sharing with us uh, this very special moment for our informal working group. Um, it, it, we would love to have time to welcome questions, but I know that it's the end of the day and we all also need to prepare for um, events that are going to happen later on. We're here sharing the same space, the same house uh, for the next couple of days. So if you have any questions, please stop us, please ask us. We will really love the opportunity to talk with you and to learn from you um, about the, our project and the work that you're involved in here in BC. Um, jo finished by saying that her vision for education in a decade was that young people would come out of the system with who they are intact, with dignity, purpose and options. We share the same goal. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you.